This is the land that historian Rachel Carley has called the last worst acreage in the Connecticut colony. From this thin rocky soil emerged the center of trade, industry, education, and culture. The development of Salisbury, Connecticut between 1800 and 1870 in many ways mirrors the broader development of the United States. These developments and their impact on people's daily lives are really grounded in four different spheres work, daily life, education, and religion. In many ways, these four spheres were interconnected. Where people lived was determined by where they worked, as was the likelihood their children would be educated. Family life and schooling were often functions of religion. And while these people are all gone, they have left behind cultural footprints that continue to provide 21st century residents of Salisbury with clues to how their town forefathers lived. This is Ore Hill, near where modern routes 44 and 112 intersect. We're looking at the remnants of an old iron ore mine that has filled with rainwater over the years, forming a large pond. Thousands of tons of ore removed from the ground by teams of men and horses. The work here was backbreaking and it was dangerous. These men were noted around town for their pale complexion because they spent so much time underground. And the dampness underground damaged their health so that many of them died before they were 60 years old. That ore that came out of this ground here was taken by teams on ox carts, horse-drawn carts, down to North Canaan where the iron furnaces were. And while the people of Salisbury thought that all of that traffic was a nuisance, it really led to a transformation of their town. The population would grow rapidly, as would the cultural and commercial offerings. But this backbreaking work transformed the Salisbury community. It had stores, it had a post office, and this story played out all across that community in places like Twin Lakes, Lime Rock, Amesville, Mount Riga. This story would be repeated. On Mount Riga, four miles northwest of Salisbury's town hall, all the natural forces that are going to help Salisbury's economy and community evolve are at play. The abundant water power up here result in 1810 with the building of this blast furnace, which would become highly profitable, one of many in the area that really transformed Salisbury into an industrial center. When you consider the fact that the iron ore that came up here was dragged up this road, really difficult conditions, by teams of oxen dragging carts from places like Ore Hill, miles away. That shows us just how valuable that water was in transforming that ore into the refined iron that could be turned into tools and many other types of finished products. What you cast in a creek comes down off of Mount Riga. And not only does it power the furnace up there, but it also powered small industries down the creek back towards Salisbury. There were only a limited number of places where the water conditions were right to allow industry to function. And those were very valuable places, so valuable in fact, that they were sold off. They were called water privileges. There were four of them heading up the mountain. One of them was a bicycle spoke factory. There were grist mills, there were saw mills, there was a finery forge where wrought iron is made. There were carding and fulling mills that turned uh, woolen and cotton products into cloth. Woolen and cotton products were Connecticut's leading manufactured goods in the 19th century. Most of these tended to be smaller operations, usually employing about a dozen people or so. Here in Lakeville, the geography really is a significant factor in the economic and even the social and cultural development of the town. 
Lakeville was called Furnace Pond until the mid-1840s. Furnace Pond gets its name from the blast furnace that was built here in 1762. By the 1790s, a community had sprung up around that furnace. A post office, stores, shops, homes. You would have also had tin shops here. A lot of small businesses around this pond using the water. In 1846, the residents of Furnace Pond decided to change the name of their community to Lakeville. In part, this was keeping with a transformation that was going on here. It was becoming more of a genteel place, more of a place for summer residents and vacationers, and they were really concerned that the name Furnace Pond was not attracting people like that to the area. However, other residents were upset, and they felt that the name Furnace Pond really spoke to the character of the community and that the town really drew something from that industrial heritage. So the closing of the uh, blast furnaces created opportunities for some people uh, in the area here. Alexander H. Hawley, who was the son of a prominent iron industrialist, he uh, knocked down the blast furnace that was here. He knocked that down in 1843, and by the next year had established a small uh, factory uh, making pocket knives. It, he was really quite successful. Uh, so much so that by 1866 he had constructed this uh, four-story large brick building behind me to enlarge his operation. And by the 1880s he was making over 100,000 pocket knives a year here. So here in Pocket Knife Square we really get a sense of just how ingenious these people were in finding ways to use their, the land and the natural resources to make a living. The, the factory pond is on the other side of the street here, and that's the source for the power that's going to operate all these small little workshops and industries that are growing up here in what's now Lakeville. They built a dam across the end of that pond, and there's a catch in the dam that pulls in the water. Too much water is going to overwhelm this. Not enough water is not going to power it. So the water drops into this turbine. Uh, probably from the 1860s, and there'll be leather belts thrown over the drive shaft connected to each of the machines, to the hammers, to the grindstones that are sharpening the pocket knives. So that's where the power is coming from off these turbines. And then the water's going to make its way back out through a pipe on the other side of the turbine, drop into the, into the water trace, and make its way back to the salmon kill. By far the largest industrial operation in the area was what was going on over in Amesville. Beginning in 1833, the company turned out locomotive axles and wheels, steamship uh, drive shafts, and, and other iron products. At its peak, it operated two 16,000 square foot facilities and 800 employees. The community featured houses for its workers, had a school for 60 students, it had a store, and it had a hotel. The appearance of iron furnaces, grist mills, sawmills, tanneries on the outskirts of town fueled the prosperity. The center of Salisbury was transformed into a civic and commercial center. So that by the mid-1800s, uh, Salisbury had a post office, Salisbury had a bank, very importantly, Salisbury had a telegraph office, which provided a link to the outside world. There was tremendous isolation in the northwest corner of Connecticut, and those links to the outside world were really valued. The other thing that you see taking place in Salisbury is the commercial growth of the town. In 1800, Salisbury had three stores. In 1840, it had 13. And these stores really sold goods from all across the world. You could find cloth, and spices, medical products, hardware, books, various types of alcohol, all of that was sold here in uh, stores in Salisbury. And the commercial aspect of it also tied the community together. In the early 1800s, this was not a cash economy. This was an economy that ran through account books. People kept account of who owed them and uh, what they owed somebody else. And in a, in a social way, these account books tied the community very closely together. You weren't a, likely to pick up and move out of town in the middle of the night if a lot of people owed you money. The other thing is a lot of these people were related. And between the way they did business and living in a community of their cousins and nieces and nephews, um, it really made this a, a tightly bound social uh, community. 
It was also in the center of Salisbury where the doctors, the lawyers, the bankers, the farmers, the iron workers, the merchants, when all these people of different walks of life got together, they could always talk about politics and they could always talk about agriculture. And this is because virtually everyone, excluding only the wealthiest, virtually everyone in Salisbury was a farmer. For all but Salisbury's wealthiest families, farming meant hard work. These dense New England forests needed to be cleared to provide the 50 to 150 acres of croplands, meadows, and gardens needed to sustain a family. And these woods themselves provided a valuable resource because every house needed 15 to 20 cords of wood a year to both heat the home and provide fuel for the cooking. Family's wealth was tied up in these farms and father's primary concern in life was to maintain this farm in order to pass down an honorable profession to their son as well as to succeed enough to provide a dowry so his daughter could be married. There was plenty of work to be done on the farm. Fences needed to be built to keep the animals out of the gardens. Most farmers had four to five cows, two to three pigs, some sheep, a couple of dozen chickens. Men and women equally worked on the farm, but they did so in different spheres. Women tended to work in and around the house, spinning wool, making clothing, canning of vegetables and fruits, smoking of meats. Women tended to the gardens. Women did all of this work inside a cycle of having a baby every other year. So women were either always pregnant or raising an infant. The average family in New England in this time period had eight to nine children, and the New England population was doubling every 25 years. Children were vital sources of labor for Salisbury's households. Up until the age of six, children were considered to be free. They were usually minded by an older sister. Around their sixth birthday, however, children received some simple chores, running errands, feeding the animals, carding wool. Around their 12th birthday, girls started to take on more responsibilities helping their mother, usually doing things like uh, helping with the wash and the ironing, uh, spinning the wool, gathering uh, eggs from the chickens and milking the cows. Around the age of 12, boys began to help their father by guiding the oxen during plowing. They planted and tended to the vegetables, and they chopped the wood. By the age of 18, both boys and girls were expected to have mastered all the jobs on the farm, and when they did this, they were considered to be ready for marriage. Initially, some of Salisbury's largest farms were tended by slaves. The 1774 colonial census shows 35 slaves living in town. However, the adoption of the Declaration of Independence led many Northerners to take its phrase, all men are created equal, seriously. This painting in the Salisbury Academy is truly a remarkable uh, piece of art. The um, painting is of Maria Coffing and for many years uh, it had been left in the basement. In the cleaning process, uh, it became apparent that there was a second figure in the painting, and that was Jenny Winslow, uh, who in Maria's father's will had been left to Maria uh, until she turned 25 years of age. And so we have Maria and we have Jenny peering around the corner in this painting. And this is really a manifestation of Connecticut's gradual emancipation laws that said that uh, any slave born after 1784 was to be freed on his or her 25th birthday. No event was more memorable in this time period for Salisbury's families in the Civil War. Uh, over 300 men from town marched off to war, and many of these men were involved in that conflict's most horrible battles, Antietam, Gettysburg, and especially memorable for Salisbury and Litchfield County was the Battle of Cold Harbor 
in June 1864, where 141 men from the county were killed in just over an hour's fighting. Another 56 men from Salisbury died of disease during the war, and 33 others came home disabled or injured, unable to live their lives the way that they had before the war. And none of these numbers take into consideration the, the men who came home traumatized by the experience, or these men who never came home at all, but got caught up in those mass movements going on in post-war America of moving west or moving to the large cities. For most children in Salisbury, their means of opportunity came through education. Public education was as old as the New England colonies. There were laws dating back to the 1600s in Massachusetts and early Connecticut called the Old Deluder Laws, which called for students to be educated so that they could read the Bible. This was the way to keep Satan at bay. After the Revolutionary War, Schools became a place where young citizens were educated, and that meant reading and writing, uh, not math. That came with uh, the industrial development in the early 1800s. These were all one-room schoolhouses. Uh, there was no means of transporting students significant distances to schools, and so you had to have a school within walking distance of your house. What did that mean for Salisbury? It meant that there were 14 school districts in Salisbury by 1824, and that number is going to remain static into the early 20th century. Outside of public education, uh, if you were well-to-do, even upper middle class, and you dreamed of sending your child to college, you needed something to bridge uh, them educationally between the one-room schoolhouse and the college or university. And in Litchfield County at that time, college meant almost exclusively Yale or Williams College. This bridge between the one-room schoolhouse and the university came through something called the academy. These were private schools that were set up um, to give students a little bit more of an advanced education. The Salisbury Academy was established in 1833 and that was its purpose, to get students ready for college. I'm sitting in the academy building right now, and the, the placement of these buildings here in Salisbury really highlights the connection between education, religion, and morality. So right next door is the Congregational Church, and just beyond that is the, uh, the Scoville Library, what we know as the first public library in the United States. In addition to the town-wide emphasis on education, the presence of libraries in town made Salisbury a really remarkable center for education and culture. The moral undertones present in the establishment of schools and libraries hints at the influence of religion on daily life in this time period. The Congregational Church in Salisbury had a tremendous influence on life in this town. Uh, the current building was built in 1800 and it really speaks to the growing prosperity in this time period. The pastor of this church played a remarkably important role in daily life in this town. He was both a counselor to the people as well as a political leader. And in Connecticut, there was no separation of church and state until 1818. And in fact, Salisbury continued to fund this church until 1824. Church services were an all-day affair in the first half of the 1800s. In fact, there were forenoon and afternoon services. And if you were a farmer coming in from the countryside, it was unlikely that you wanted to return back to the farm for a meal during the break. And so uh, most farmers constructed what were called Sabbath day or Sabbath day houses, uh, small shacks around the structure where their family could gather to share a meal during the break. And in fact, the wealthy also built 34 horse sheds out behind this building where they could keep their horse and buggy during the services. By far the most important religious development in Salisbury during this time period was the Second Great Awakening, a series of religious revivals that swept across the north. These were particularly popular in northwestern Connecticut, where people spoke of a Litchfield County divinity. In fact, in 1815, Joshua Bradley, an observer, wrote, Sinners hasten to Christ as clouds, as doves fly to their windows. From the most accurate information received, 
I conclude that 700 were born again in these towns in the course of the revival. Here in Salisbury, the revivals took place out on the lawn of the church with calls for repentance, and they were wildly successful. Whereas male membership in the church had fallen to only 20, uh, by the end of this series of revivals, it had swelled to almost 200. The enthusiasm sparked by the Second Great Awakening led to a series of, of reform movements based upon the desire of parents to create a perfectly moral society in which to raise their children. This was known as the cult of domesticity, and it included such movements as temperance, the call for public education and prison reform, women's suffrage, and ultimately abolitionism. Litchfield was the uh, founding point for the temperance movement in 1789, and by 1829 there was a statewide Connecticut temperance society. All of this met with mixed results. For example, in Salisbury, 374 people by 1832 had taken a pledge to total abstinence, but there were still 56 people classified by the town as habitual drunks. Changes in Salisbury's population manifested themselves in changes in the religious life in town. Whereas in 1840 the population stood at about 2,500, in 1880 the population was 3,700, and a large chunk of that increase was due to the presence of Irish Catholic immigrants in the town, and their presence led to the establishment of St. Mary's Church in 1875. This is the old uh, route of the Connecticut Western Railroad, what's now a bike path between Salisbury and Lakeville. The railroad came to town in 1870, and it had stops both in Salisbury and in Lakeville, and it really had a major impact on the Salisbury community. Uh, one of those impacts was economic. The people of these towns no longer had to make all of the goods that they had to use. They could bring them in from other markets. This area had been an artist and an author's enclave since the 1850s, but the arrival of the railroad brought with it hotels and inns and restaurants that would really bring a lot more tourists and vacationers to this area. Another important thing that happened around that time period in 1870 was the flooding of the dam up on Mount Riga. It overwhelmed that dam, sent water rushing down the creek, and damaged several of those small shops and small industries that came down the side of that mountain. In 1800, Salisbury was an industrial center, a place where people look to use natural resources to overcome a lot of the obstacles that geography provided them with. By 1870, with the coming of the railroad, with the coming of immigrants, with the flooding that destroyed a lot of those old industries, it was clear that Salisbury was about to undergo a shift and that it would become a place whose future was tied very strongly to the developing of a cultural center as well as it becoming a center of education.